Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Palestine in session. I have a very, very special guest with us today. Francesca Albanese is an affiliate scholar at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University and a senior advisor on migration and forced displacement for the think tank Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development. She published widely on the legal situation in Israel-Palestine. Her latest book, Palestinian Refugees and International Law, offers a comprehensive legal analysis of the situation of Palestinian refugees from its origins to modern day reality. Ms. Francesca Albanese was appointed the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories Occupied Since 1967 by the Human Rights Council on, in uh, March of 2022 and has taken up her function as of May of 2022. I left out some crucial points um, in, her, uh, in her long resume. Please, if you, uh, if you go to, uh, if you just Google her, you can get the full, the full length of it, but I really want to get straight to it. Um, Francesca, thank you for joining us. And it's almost your one year anniversary as special repertoire. Uh, in May of this year, it'll be, it'll make one year. I want to start off this conversation by just first allowing you to explain your role as special repertoire or SP. What is your mandate and what does your role entail? Thank you very much, Tarek. And first of all, let me thank you and AMP for inviting me for this opportunity, which is splendid. And um, and also tell everyone Ramadan Karim in case uh, this Ramadan is shown <laughs> during during still Ramadan time. Um, and so yes, I assumed the functions of special rapporteur on the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, upon conferral of this uh, important and delicate mandate by the Human Rights Council um, on May 1st of last year. So it's been almost one year. And I inherited, so to speak, this position um, after uh, eminent legal experts had served on it, like my immediate predecessor was Professor Michael Link and Professor Richard Falk before him. And um, mm, Professor Judge um, and Judge um, John Dugard. Uh, so these are really um, th th these have paid the way for for me to know that what is what is the way and the and the legacy of the mandate I'm inherited. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, with the work of a special rapporteur, we are independent experts serving on a voluntary basis. Um, uh, on a mandate of um, up to six years, which includes monitoring and, and documenting, reporting to the Human Rights Council, and in my case, also to the General Assembly, on a given human rights situation. So there are thematic report, uh, rapporteurs, freedom of expression, human rights defenders, albinism, uh, counterterrorism. And, um, and then there are a number of country-based mandates, geographic mandates. This is my case. I'm the eighth special rapporteur and the first woman to serve on this mandate. I'm so proud of it. Um, so our main responsibility is really to writing reports that are official account on the reality on the ground. But if I can tell you, I mean, I had to ask myself, what kind of special rapporteurs I want to be, because certainly my mandate is no one that can shed the light on the unknown or on the undocumented, because probably there is no other human rights context as well documented, no other context in which international law violations are as thoroughly documented as in the case of the occupied Palestinian territory. And also, I, I, I realized that I cannot be the one really setting the standards, uh, advancing international law in this sense, because the standards are very clear. So I said, my mandate is to be, on the one hand, clarifying the meaning um, of international law in a holistic fashion, because it's a protracted situation and there are various bodies of law intersecting. Um, 
And, and so what, what does it all mean? For example, we talk of an occupation, but we also talk of a prolonged occupation, a belligerent occupation. And now there is this discourse of apartheid and the role of the International Criminal Court. So um, I thought that I had to make sense. And the other, the other important point is that I really wanted to honor the work um, of human rights defenders, primarily the Palestinians, but also Israelis who do such an important pivotal uh, and pioneering role in, in monitoring and documenting the violations in the occupied Palestinian territory. And I said, I need to create a space for them to be heard. Of course, I, I, I do my assessment on an independent basis, but also what I mean is that I need to make sure that there is enough space. And this is what the UN is to be a guarantor uh, of for them to speak out, for them to carry out their advocacy, because now it's very much at risk because of the shrinking space around uh, civil society advocating in and on Palestine. So this is how, in a nutshell, <laughs> I interpret my mandate. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, <laughs> the, the, the work that a special repertoire does is just absolutely unbelievable, and, and it is absolutely essential. And you actually put out your first report um, quite recently, and you centered your report on the concept of self-determination. So we hear a lot about Palestinian self-determination, and you, and you wrote in your report, quote, the right to self-determination constitutes the collective right par excellence and the platform right necessary for the realization of many other rights. So I want you to, ex to expound on the principle of self-determination and address how its denial for the Palestinian people forms an inherent part of Israel's overall settler colonial project. Yeah, uh, Tarek, if you allow me to say why I decided to start my mandate with this particular right, Please. because I noticed even, I mean, I've been engaged, as you as you mentioned at the very beginning, I mean, it's it's clear that I've been engaged with the question of Israel, Palestine, Palestine, the occupation of Palestine for quite a while before becoming a special rapporteur. And I've been puzzled by the way the concept of self-determination, this right, which is so fundamental and I will get to it, has been often referred to in a rhetorical fashion, but without people really understanding what it means. It's also quite a, a complicated right in the sense that um, it's, so, it's so common, commonly enjoyed, but not always, but commonly enjoyed by people who have their own state or people who are protected as a minority that it's not obvious what it means for a people like Palestine, whose right, for, for whom this right has, is, has been recognized for 100 years, and it's still, even before being codified as a universal right, and it's still, um, it's still unrealized. And especially, this is particularly relevant because the international community insists that there should be uh, a Palestinian state, and there should be the realization of the right of self-determination, but sort of making the, the second conditional upon the realization of the first, so the negotiation condition, which is also a little bit uh, awkward to a, to a legal mind. And I said, okay, we need to clarify that. But also, um, I'm, I'm very I'm very happy that there has been a denunciation of the, the, the apartheid regime, because there is apartheid. There is no question about that. But in fact, I, I mean... In, for those under occupation, I mean, saying that there is apartheid is the minimum bearable to start to comprehend the widespread the system, systemic, cruel, racist nature of the regime that through this occupation Israel has put in place. Because in reality, there in the apartheid, I mean, in most of the analysis, um, there is an, a missing element. And again, I don't say that as a criticism to uh, the human rights um, organizations which, which have denounced apartheid. They have done an incredible job. At the same time, they have missed the concept of self-determination, treating it as a political issue. No. And we go to the core of my report. So I wanted to square the, and center the debate on this right, because this is the right of all rights, is the right of the people to exist as a people, politically uh, and culturally, economically, socially. This is why I say it's the right of all other rights, because if you are not protected within, um, uh, within a, 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 let's say, a normative and institutional environment, which must exist 
for to you know, to protect its rights. What is it? And and mind you, I don't say that statehood is the only way for the Palestinian, meaning an independent statehood is the only way for the Palestinians to realize these rights, because they can also realize this right as a part of, um, let's say, a bigger state where they are still recognized as full citizens, minority or majority, it doesn't matter, they need to be full citizens. And this is, so this is the, the thing, I, I've said whatever is the political solution, I'm agnostic, but there should be a free choice of the Palestinians. So even this is why I said, let's start with unpacking the, uh, the, the um, what is the international consensus, the realization of a two state solution with an independent, independent Palestinian state. And yes, Israeli occupation has intentionally prevented the realization of the right of self-determination. How? In four different ways. By, sorry, you wanted to say something? Ah, uh, by um, by uh, infringing upon the um, acting in violation of the territorial sovereignty in the occupied Palestinian territory. The occupied Palestinian territory, namely what remains of historical Palestine, should be a territorial unit. Gaza is Jerusalem and West Bank should be one. And no, there has been an intentional separation, fragmentation, annexation in in addition to the transfer of uh, civilians, Israeli civilians. Now, the transfer doesn't mean that Israel has forcibly transferred. There is only one forcible transfer, and this is the Palestinians in the OPT. But it means encouraging, supporting, building houses, taking the land, having the army um, encircling Palestinian land, closing for military zones, uh, as military zones, and then passing the land to the to the settlers. This is a settlement enterprise. This is a colonizing enterprise. Then the second is the sovereignty over natural resources, stones, land, water, um, everything that, that that land produces should be used by the Palestinians. There have been ample documentation of the economic costs of the occupation. This is not just a cost for the, uh, for the occupied. This is um, a huge gain for the occupier, which also profits from it and even sells the outcome of this, uh, this exploitative and acquisitive activity, which is a crime in itself, by the way. And, uh, and then the third element is the repression of the Palestinian political activity. I mean, it's documented that um, uh, since the 60, 60s, I, I not looked into preview, uh, previous um, data, but I've, I've read the documentation that exists um, that, that, that um, uh, proves that as of the 60s the, and 70s, Israel has engaged in, um, in repression and even targeted killing of uh, Palestinian leaders. And I'm not talking of political uh, ranks, I'm talking of teachers, of intellectuals, of, uh, of religious leaders. Anyone who could carry a political significance yeah, would face would face uh, a, an unhappy ending, um, and and this has gone pretty much pretty much unchecked. Um, and then there is also the suppression the suppression of the cultural existence of a people. So you see, the four elements of the right of self determination exist on a territory, economically, politically, socially, and culturally. Imagine that the, the repression of people uh, waving their flag. This is typical of a settler colonial regime, I mean, of a colonial regime. The settlement element comes into equation because there is a transfer of Israelis, Israeli Jews, into the occupied territory. And, um, and, uh, and this is, a, as I said, it's prima facie a war crime. It's incompatible with, in, with international law. Um, and it's fully documented. I mean, in the word zero colonies in 1967, and now there are 750. There were zero settlers, and now there are 750,000. So this is why I call it settler colonial. No, uh, the, 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 the term is spot on because it gives a holistic notion of, um, 
of you know the 75 year period and not and not just this 55 year period which you are uh, focused on in in your mandate and you kind of touched on my next question here and I kind of want you to expand a little bit on it so the term apartheid has gained a lot of traction in our political discourse mainly because of the various human rights organizations that have put out reports um, declaring Israel to be an apartheid regime. Um, Beth Salem, Israeli Human Rights Organization, Human Rights Watch, International Human Rights Organization, Amnesty International, the most esteemed international human rights organization. And you've, and you've highlighted in your, in your uh, answer to the last question that it, it does carry some limitations. So I want you to just expand a little bit on that. Can you give us some insight on the apartheid framework in the context of the Israeli occupation? And if such framing can be sufficient to explain the totality of the, of the Palestinian experience. And before you answer, you did mention in your report vis-a-vis um, um, uh, -vis a, uh, apartheid that if it's not implied in a holistic fashion, it will miss the point. So could you, could you expand on that? How, how can we apply the apartheid in a, in a holistic fashion that can, that can suffice as framing for the entire Palestinian experience. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, and, um, and again, I think that the, the apartheid framework is absolutely, absolutely necessary and correct. Um, it's correct to use it. And I often say that the Palestinian experience is helping the South Africanize the, the apartheid framework, which is very, very much necessary. I'm sure that after this, um, there will be um, um, greater ease in understanding the dynamics of an apartheid regime, like um, um, a white a system of widespread uh, systemic um, racial discrimination um, maintained with intent to dominate and then entailing cruel practices and crimes. And it constitutes a, a crime against humanity under the Rome Statute. So it's it's identified in international law as a crime in itself, and it's a crime prosecuted on, by the by the Rome State under the Rome Statute. Um, and um, at the same time, there is some important difference with the case of South Africa, um, in the sense that the occupied Palestinian territory is one over which Israel doesn't have sovereignty. There is the element of the military occupation. The military occupation is being used as a, uh, as a vehicle, as a vehicle to occupy the land, dispossessing the Palestinian, displacing them and replacing them. Displace and replace, as Patrick Wolf and Ilan Pape have uh, underscored, these are elements, key um, structural elements of settler colonialism. Apartheid, having racial discrimination, is a is a natural is a natural uh, corollary, is a natural consequence rather of it. So, in order to overcome, how do we fix it? And there is no easy fix. But the moting, I mean, dismantling. A is not sufficient because again i unlike many i think that it should be the palestinians including those under occupation deciding whether they want to be part of a one state solution or not this is not something i assume i mean we might have our own ideas it would be better it would be like a, a way to reunite again the palestinian people i don't doubt about it but i think that we shouldn't assume and we should because this is also part of the recognition of the right of self-determination the capacity of people to choose for themselves you see what i mean um and therefore i say there is a step that we cannot miss and we cannot skip and it's the how do we do that ending the occupation. Voila. <laughs> I know it's not simple. I know it's not easy and not pain-free, but this is what needs to be done in order. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And, you know, as a, as a Palestinian, when I speak on this issue, I always, um, especially in, in light of the recent reports that have uh, come out um, labeling Israel and an apartheid regime, is that they the analysis seems to be surrounded around the question of governance. 
when in the Palestinian intellectual tradition, um, the analysis stems from ideology, not just from a system of governance. So, you know, um, the conclusion would be from these reports is that Israel, I mean, look at Human Rights Watch uh, report, the, the theme, the title, a threshold crossed, which implies that Israel yeah. over time became <laughs> an apartheid regime, whereas the Palestinian intellectual tra tradition says Israel was founded as an apartheid regime. And that's a, that's a different way of framing how Israel came to be, you know, because that, and then that sheds light on 48 and not just on, you know, decades later and the occupied territories. So that, that this is a distinction that I think is, is essential for people to understand from the Palestinian perspective, to understand the Palestinian narrative and how we, um, how we conceptualize our history and the, and the Israeli state. I want to I wanna just move forward on a very particular topic of East Jerusalem. And yeah, I mean, just, just, a brief, just a brief history. Israel immediately de, de facto annexed East Jerusalem in June of 67, and then de jure annexed it um, via Basic Law 1980. And it's so refreshing that I can talk to somebody that I don't have to explain the difference between de facto and de jure. So uh, thank you. Thank you for being on uh, for that. But <laughs> Um, de, de jure annexation um, via Basic Law 1980. The international community rejected these measures out of hand. And then the Trump Declaration came in 2017, declaring Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. The world essentially did not follow that. Can you speak to the notion of annexation under international law and how this applies to East Jerusalem specifically? Hmm. Okay. Um, so... Annexation is, uh, is something that is absolutely prohibited in international law. Why so? Because it consists of the acquisition of territory by force. And you know, it's prohibited because in, in the international order, uh, recognizing the possibility that states could use their, uh, their um, outstanding force in order to subjugate, to dominate, to acquire control of other populations through control of their territories, was something that was seen as a menace, as a threat to, to peace and security. And because the post-World War II or order is premised upon this um, desperate need to ensure peace and security, um, annexation was was sort of it was not prohibited as such but it was um, the, the, the the use of force and the prohibition of the acquisition of territory by force was sort of inspirational um, to the uh, to the drafting of the UN charter in fact this is this at, at article 2.4 but this is also prohibited by the Geneva conventions and, and it's considered tantamount to a, to a war crime. So uh, it's so illegal that you, it, it cannot produce legal effects. Uh, so the recognition of Jerusalem as, as a, the capital of the state of Israel means uh, that it has no legal effect, right? Because two wrongs do not make a right. <laughs> And, uh, and this is, I cannot put it more in a, in a simpler way than this. So since 1947, the entirety of Jerusalem, not just this Jerusalem, the entirety of this Jerusalem has been regarded as a corpus separatum, meaning an international city that was to be administered by, United, by the United Nations via the Trusteeship Council. Then, as you rightly said, in 1967, Israel occupied it. Until that point, it had been um, under Jordanian control. Now, even there, I mean, the, the Jordanian had annexed um, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem in contravention with international law as well. And this is something that the Arab community through the League of Arab uh, States rejected. So it has never been really recognized. But however, the, the 1967 occupation 
uh, didn't change the status of Jerusalem. So since then, Israel has attempted to alter the legal status, the character, the demographic composition of the, of the city. And these efforts have culminated with the adoption of the basic law, uh, Jerusalem capital of Israel in 1980. This was seen as a, such a bold and uh, regrettable, despicable move by the international community that even the Security Council, which has never been particularly critical of Israel, uh, passed a resolution, Resolution 478, which set forth that the acquisition of territory by force is inadmissible and that all legislative and administrative measures that Israel as an occupying power which is a specific language recalling the occupied nature of the, of the city. So the, any action um, taken by uh, Israel aiming to uh, alter or purported to alter the character and status of Jerusalem um, are null and void. And the basic law was ordered to be rescinded forthwith. So this is the level of illegality. Um, so this stance has been reaffirmed several times by the G General Assembly and in the UN Security Council uh, last time in 2007, 2016 uh, with Resolution 2334 that defined the annexation of Jerusalem as flag fra flagrant violation of international law. Then, you know, uh, there are, as I said, there are states who blatantly act against international law and the result is that they just undermine, uh, they, they, they make a travesty of international law and uh, which doesn't affect the force of international law, but its capacity to be enforced. So, and international law is as strong as the will of states to make it a reality. This is, but again, as I said, two wrongs don't make a right. You know, you mentioned something there that I think is absolutely essential that goes missed a lot in the discourse around Jerusalem. Um, the corpus separatum concept is a concept yeah. that applies to the, Jeru the Jerusalem area in total and not just East Jerusalem. Israel is a, is a belligerent occupier in East Jerusalem, but in West Jerusalem, it has de facto control, but not sovereignty. And that's that's the key that keeps you know, uh, keeps being missed because when I, when I, when I listen to our media, our, our, our mainstream media, there are some personnel that would say, well, the, you know, the liberals, um, the liberals that still support the move to declare the, to declare Jer Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, they'll say, well, if you move the embassy to West Jerusalem, that's okay. East Jerusalem, it's not. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. West Jerusalem is also part of the corpus separatum concept that was in Resolution 181 and reaffirmed in Resolution 194. I want to talk about that in a second. Re res no, correct. correct. Yeah, I mean, it's just, but but it goes missed. The, the analysis sometimes gets missed. And even even with our, uh, even, even with those that are in my camp, uh, our, you know, Palestinian activists and, and others, you know, it, because on the ground, it seems like, you know, it doesn't make sense. I mean, these, there are some blind spots on, in international law. So West Jerusalem was con was uh, captured through conquest. Same thing with East Jerusalem. But international law developed to uh, to an extent where Israel would be classified as a belligerent occupier in East Jerusalem, but it did not have that status in West Jerusalem. Because some people ask me, why isn't Israel a belligerent occupier in West Jerusalem? Didn't they conquer it through war as well? It just became normalized. But at the very least, the rest of the area became normalized as part of the internationally recognized borders, but not West mm -hmm. Jerusalem. But it also that Israel, let's say, Israel has treated um, West Jerusalem as annexed since, uh, yeah, since earlier than uh, the 1967. One in 1967, right. the extension of the regime was part of the, uh, yeah, occupation. The uh, let's say the, the as I said, the vehicle of the occupation. And, but again, it's very important to remind everyone, yeah. <laughs> It's the entirety of Jerusalem, which is uh, which is a corpus separatum under under international law and consensus. There is another question I had vis-a-vis -vis East Jerusalem, but I wanted to talk about Resolution One Nine Four just uh, briefly because you wrote about Palestinian refugees, and um, there's this misunderstanding that Resolution One Nine Four is the foundational right for the right of return for Palestinian uh, refugees instead of a reaffirmation of an already existing right. Can you explain why that is and, and why has there been this misconception that 194 is the foundational right? Like that's where it stems from. 
why why is that the understanding? And it, it, it's, it's legally incorrect. Yeah, I think that it's legally it it, it weakens it weakens right. the, the the force of the right of return because look, it's true that there is no such a thing like right of return, but there is not such a thing as right of return in international law. But there is the right of return is a com is a concept that stems from a composition of rights which already existed in pre-1947. There was the prohibition of denationalization in mass. So the, the 750,000 Palestinians who were dispossessed, expelled many at gunpoints or forced to flee, and I mean, they, who, who fled generalized violence, this doesn't matter. They were not allowed to return. There was a military order passed by the um, transi transitional government uh, in between May in, in June, which would consider the, the, the refugees, the returnees, as, um, as infiltrators. Uh, and so there was the shoot to kill, an authorization to the shoot to kill policy. Um, so the, there was a prohibition. And then there was a, a law passed that de facto made it impossible for the Palestinians who were up, absent from the, from the territory of Israel to apply for nationality. Uh, so it's not that there was a piece of law saying, ah, they are, they are prohibited, they are, they are denationalized, but they were national of Palestine with British citizens, uh, British, uh, um, man, uh, sorry, uh, British uh, Palestine Monday, uh, sorry, um, passport. And this was, uh, was became, um, I mean, it, it, there was, should have been a succession of uh, state uh, uh, sort of discipline. And these people should have been allowed to choose whether to become citizens of Israel or not. And this possibility was never afforded to them. So this is the first point. Denationalization and mass was already prohibited by them. And it was, this concept was also um, in, sort of enshrined by the partition plan, which uh, I think it's Article 11 or Chapter 11 of the, the partition plan that establishes that the Palestinian, uh, sorry, then the Arab citizens of the Jewish state and the Jewish citizens of the Arab state would have been uh, would have been treated as a, as citizens but part of a minority and they could have had the right to also move to the other states. Voila. And so this, it, it's clear that this principle existed and it was violated. The other thing is that the Palestinians became refugees in a con the Arabs of Palestine time, which now it's fair to call Palestinians, became refugees in a context of hostilities. There were, there, there were no Geneva conventions, but it was clear that the Hague regulations were already part of customary law. And they didn't authorize the, 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 the finalization of peace agreements until the prisoners of war, the only one which were legally, which could legally be held outside the area of the hostilities, were allowed to come in. To return, so it's a, it's a fortiori. So if the the prisoners of war had to be returned, how come that those who shouldn't have been displaced in the first place, the civilians, were not contemplated? They shouldn't have been displaced because Article 42, 43 of the Hague Regulation protected or civilian life um, in the context of uh, hostilities or an occupation. And uh, and the, the the other the other element is that since 1927 there was this principle of compensation of com no compensation reparations for international wrongdoings, uh, which had been recognized, which had not been codified per se, but it had been code, um, recognized as a general principles of principle of international law, but the permanent International Court of Justice, which is the precursor of the current ICJ, the International Court of Justice, which had stipulated that first of all, the first form of to make, um, to, to correct a wrongdoing at international level was to the restitution, so was to return whatever what was still ex materially existing. And then, so every house, every piece of land should have been returned, turn, returned to the legitimate owner. And in the material impossibility of returning, whatever had been dis destroyed should have been compensated. So international law as it stood back then was even more, um, more uh, generous 
than what Resolution 194 stipulates. But Resolution 194 is not a resolution about the refugees. It's a, it's a, a roadmap for peace. It's a resolution to, uh, that walks on the heels of Resolution 181. So 181 had proposed partition, there was a civil war, and then a war with a huge refugee crisis. And, um, and then the, 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 the United Nations proposed to have a conciliation commission to mediate there is an, there was nothing to mediate we know but back then it was decided that there should be a mediation between the newly constituted state of israel and jewish state and um, and the arab states the palestinian were not in the picture and um, and um, and as part of it the ref refugees were could choose to return if they were willing not to take arms uh, against uh, the, 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 the Jewish state. This is what Article 11 says. Or resettle elsewhere. So there was the panoply of, uh, of uh, the durable solutions. Go back or move to another place. None of them has really become available for the majority of the refugees. Yeah, absolutely. And it's up to the Palestinians to decide, not for people to decide for them. That's another... Yeah. Uh, uh, crucial point, and um, just one, uh, just one other fact that I wanna that I wanna add is that Israel actually accepted Resolution One Nine Four as a condition for its admittance into the into the United Nations, and then just just look and Resolution One Eight One and Resolution One Eight One, and just look the other way after that. So um, there, there, <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you for expanding on that, and I, I just want to briefly. Uh, I know we're we're, sk we're skipping a little bit. But I, I wanted to touch on 194. I didn't want to forget about that. I want yeah, to go back plus, to you know, the question of Palestinian refugees, as, and that book I wrote is considered my baby. So <laughs> whenever yeah. I have the chance to talk about that, I take off my special rapporteur's hat and I, I go back need, to my, yeah. We need to bring you back then. So we can go uh, yeah. further, further, further in depth on that. Yes. Um, so back to East Jerusalem, and I, I want to talk specifically about the residents because the Palestinians that live in East Jerusalem are residents as opposed to citizens. So how does this conditional residency, and it is conditional, um, how does that status uh, impact their lives on the ground? Um, I mean, we see it, we, we see it, we've seen it for the last 50, 55 years, and there's, you know, been, been a host of ways of, you know, removing Palestinians um, through various mechanisms. Can you please speak to that? Yes, um, it's a it's a huge and, and very complex issue, but I will try to to make it to make it quite quite brief and accessible. Looking at the challenges, yeah, Jeru most Jerusalemites do not have citizenship, although because in the beginning, as you know, many of them wouldn't apply uh, in order not to recognize the state of Israel for political reasons, whatever. But over time, and especially in the past uh, 30 years, I believe, um, the number of applications for citizenship um, have increased, but there has not been a, a real, real follow up in the sense there is a huge backlog um, on the Israeli level. So the Jerusalemites find themselves in a, in a highly precarious situation because most of them are, as have residency status, and this residency status is not a, a protective status because it's something that can be easily and often revoked by the by the Israelis upon a number of um, of criteria, and I will get into it in a minute. But and uh, there are at least fifteen thousand. Mean that if your citizenship, sorry, if your residency is revoked, you are no longer authorized to be in uh, in Jerusalem, and only Palestinians can uh, experience this because I mean, and, and probably foreigners who are not uh, not not permanent residents or not not citizens. But uh, uh, let's say the this the 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 revocation of residency leads to the forcible transfer and deportation of. And of course, this is from a legal point of view, this is a grave breach of the Geneva Convention and potentially a war crime under international law. So this is also something that is up to the International Criminal Court to consider or 
to, to domestic courts under the principle of the universal jurisdiction. I keep on insisting on that, and I'm glad to speak to an audience so in a limited, um, yeah, a limited consideration. But however, going back to your question, there are three oh, discriminatory and illegal uh, ways uh, in which Palestinians are expelled from Jerusalem, meaning why the residency status can be revoked. First, there is the breach of allegiance to the occupying power, meaning the Palestinians do not uh, uh, pledge allegiance uh, to the occupying power. But it's not that they are asked. I mean, Israel might claim, as it has happened in the case of Salah Hamouri through, <laughs> through secret evidence, that they had been, uh, they had been acting uh, in, a way, um, in a way that played against the state of Israel. But this is against international law because an occupying power cannot, cannot oblige the occupied population to pledge alliance to it. This is, and it's clear why, because in order to protect uh, the, the, the occupied population. The other element, which is in fact more common because the breach of alliance, it's a recent, it's quite a recent phenomenon, but historically, what I, I mean, most of the um, residencies have been uh, revoked um, through the element of the, through the, the lack of capacity of a Jerusalemite to prove that Jerusalem was its uh, permanent center of life. For example, a Jerusalemite whose job is in Ramallah uh, is deemed by Israel uh, not to have uh, his center of life uh, in, um, in, uh, in Jerusalem, but in Palestine. And therefore, um, he, had, uh, he had the revocation of residency, but also living abroad for more than a number of years. Uh, I can't remember now uh, how many, but leads to, or the Seven fact years. of acquiring... Seven. Sorry? Seven years. Seven. Seven. Um, so acquiring the citizenship of another country um, is, uh, although, I mean, this would be absolutely normal because Jerusalemites do not, are, are stateless, so they don't have citizenship. Um, stateless doesn't mean without a Palestinian state, but without the protection of a state, because effectively the state of Palestine doesn't have independence, so cannot work as, as, a, as a, an effective independent sovereign. So, uh, but living abroad for more than seven years, or so acquiring uh, another state's citizenship, lead to revocation of, of residency. So it's extremely, extremely draconian. And the regime that Israel imposes on the Jerusalemites, and uh, yeah, their state is very precarious. Unfortunately, so um, I want to shift gears just a little bit here and talk about what you know has been just a huge topic um, for the past twenty-something years, and that's the so-called peace process, the Oz, the so-called Oslo framework. How does that fit into the notion of? Palestinian self-determination. How does that impact it in any way? I mean, um, does that are we are we limiting the discussion? Is it is it? I mean, what what do, what do you think about that? Yeah, the Oslo the Oslo Accords have complicated uh, a lot the the question of the realization of the self-determination. First and foremost, because they have uh, given the illusion that a consolidation of the Palestinian state was in theory, was ongoing. But in fact, they have de facto uh, consolidated a form of control in another guise, and um, uh, in this guise, in fact. And uh, what the Palestinians would have achieved through Oslo um, would be autonomy at best. So um, a form of deprivation of sovereignty in the forms of an in, in the form of an independent state in perpetuity. So reading Oslo, uh, the Oslo Accords, this is the sense. Okay, one can say, yeah, but they were supposed to be an interim agreement. Yeah, but an interim agreement that is not premised upon the very essential uh, requisite in order to um, for a people to 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 exercise a sense of sovereignty, meaning independence, uh, liberation from the occupation. Mm, let's say that has been, in my view, 
And this is something that we know exposed. It has been short-sighted to expect that leaving out the key concept like Jerusalem, I understand the refugees to an extent, but not the concept of self-determination. Self-determination is first and foremost the right to be free, independence, the freedom from alien control and domination. And the Oslo were not geared to this. Not only they were not geared to this, they have given the impression then now there are the parties. So there is Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, like or vis a vis the, the state of Palestine, but then the Palestinians are fragmented, they don't get along, they are not a reliable uh, uh, interlocutor for peace. This is just a way to deflect the attention from the root cause of the problem, is that Oslo has not um, disentangled the matrix of control that bounds the territory and the Palestinian people. Uh, Israel has remained the occupier and has remained and has consolidated as a, as a colonizer. So the other issue that I see, and of course there are many, but the other issue that I see um, is that um, the Oslo Accords, although they had a time frame and the time has passed, and I don't see any real attempt to, to, to recognize the fact that the expiry date is passed. I mean, there are, of course, scholars and Palestinian organizations claiming that. There is also, I really, I really like the analysis of um, um, the University of Berzay's professor, Asim Khalil, uh, who said, well, it's invalid. If an, an agreement cannot be interpreted against uh, international law, so in violation of the right of self-determination, which is a peremptory norm of international law. It's foundational to the very UN system. It cannot be considered valid an agreement that is, uh, that first of all, leads to the violation of fundamental rights in a situation of occupation. This is against the Geneva Convention or, or hostilities. Also, an, an an agreement that leads to the violation of such a fundamental right. So even if the Oslo agreement were valid uh, and were still valid, they cannot be interpreted against the right of self-determination. What does it lead to? The occupation must end. No, absolutely. And um, I, I, I like how you highlighted in your report, um, you know, in a way the peace process has led to uh, shifting gears away from a decolonization struggle into a struggle just to achieve straighthood as the as yeah. as the end, even though it should be the bare minimum versus the end result of the of this situation. And that's a that's a very interesting point that we have to be cognizant of. Um, just just one last uh, one last question here, and this is relevant to what is happening on the ground right now. I mean, we've seen upticks the past few years in violence during Ramadan especially at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. What do, you, what do you make of what is actually happening on the ground? And also, I want you to speak to the status quo arrangement that has existed for decades. Is that arrangement in danger? Um, what, do you, what, what do you see these, uh, these events, these yearly events during Ramadan? Um, is there, is there, is there, can that lead to something that's even more drastic than, just, than what you've described all, all along, the, 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 the denial of self-determination for the Palestinians? Is there, can something more happen as a result of these yearly events during Ramadan? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I mean, as you might have uh, noticed from a condemnation, uh, that from a statement that I issued um, last week con condemning the violence against the worshippers in Al-Aqsa Mosque, I think that Israel's recent attacks on the compound were reckless and fully documented. Um, beyond violating the status quo agreement, which I'll get to in, in a minute, Israel is under an obligation to respect uh, the basic human rights of the Palestinian, including the right to worship and the right uh, to prevent damage to religious uh, um, institutions and buildings. And now let me say, this applies to Palestinian, sorry, to Muslim places and worshippers, but also Christian places and worshippers, because this year in particular, and again, and this is where I often resent the limitation of the mandate, the, the limitation of, not the mandate, but the, the limitations of, of capacity being voluntary and not having a real 
I mean, not having much capacity to follow all violations that happen. But this year, the, the violence against the Christian communities have been uh, enormous. And there was not able to carry out a full investigation. But I'm grateful to the to the Palestinian Christian communities who have alerted me upon that. And I intend to continue because this is something recurrent. So, and, and this we and here we go to we go to the next point I wanted to raise. So this violence that has been uh, unconscionable is not unprecedented, is not isolated. It's uh, so and it, this is true in two ways. First of all, um, Ramadan has been uh, seen as a moment of heightened tension and there has been violence in Ramadan in two, and the, um, particularly um, Al -Aqsa, the Al-Aqsa uh, mosque and compound, Haram al-Sharif compounds were hotspots of, uh, of violence in 2021 and in 2022. I mean, less in 2022. In 2021, it was, uh, it was really brutal. And then this... this this, the violence against worshippers are, has caused the tensions with armed groups in Gaza, uh, leading to um, indiscriminate attacks against civilians uh, from both parts and against both parts, and concerns about escalation and devastations on, on both sides of the Green Line. So this is why what I, what Israel, I conclude what Israel has done was not only unlawful, but was also, and there is again the element also of the status quo that I will end, but also very morally reprehensible because they knew that they would, by 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 mistreating the, the, the worshippers, they would trigger a, re, a, a, a reaction uh, from from Gaza and uh, from, I mean, from armed groups in Gaza because it had already happened. And then there is another element because which is which is interesting. I'm studying this this concept of escalation domino, as a which is intentionally engineered by Israel, which for three consecutive years has provoked Palestinians by attacking the third holiest site in Islam and a prime symbol of Palestinian identity, pushing the Palestinians into the clearly suicidal, politically speaking, cycle of rocket, rockets versus bombing. And in this context, of course, it's very easy to play the victim. And, and what, is, what is really disturbing is that there is such an, a senseless loss of life on both sides. Uh, and I don't mean to, to equate uh, pain or suffering, and I don't want to do that. At the same time, it's clear that there is a responsibility upon Israel that, as an occupying power that for me is uncomparable with the rest. And um, now going back to the status quo, the last point is that uh, according to the status quo in force, I understand uh, that it's the Islamic Waqf, waqf uh, under the custodianship of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the only recognized authority for managing the site. So Israel could not determine the, the, the who enters and who doesn't. And it's, it's, it's been agreed that... The, that Al-Aqsa Mosque, at least for the time being, under the status quo agreement, is a place for prayer exclusive to Muslim. But since the Second Intifada, Israel has acted in contravention of the agreement multiple times. So restoring compliance with international law and upholding the status quo agreement is imperative to prevent further escalation. And I say that, uh, um, I, I mean, I, I don't want to um, to discard the fact that um, the Jewish people have religious historical connection with many places in the occupied Palestinian territory. But this doesn't entitle to the claims of sovereignty that Israel brings forward. And plus, when it comes to that particular place, there is an agreement in place in order to avoid confrontation, because it would be very nice to have all people praying peacefully in the same land. But this is not going to happen. And as long as Israel acts as an occupier outside what is permitted by international law and as a colonizer, this is my this is my two cents on the matter. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, there's just so so many questions that I want to ask you, and I can't believe we're almost uh, almost an hour in, Francesca. Um, I really, really want to thank you for uh, joining us. And 
I want our viewers to know how they can um, see, you know, your daily statements and what and what it is that you're saying. Um, if you want the if you want the long versions, you know, you want to read her reports. Um, and she already she already put out a report centered on self determination. And you have do you have a second report coming off, Francesca, at some point? Yes. Um, yes. What is that? Thank what is that on? What it's about the tradition of liberty. So I decided to write about carcerality, arrest and detention, because it's widespread and uh, and pretty ugly. It's really ugly. It's so massive, and uh, it's been it's a painful report to write, and it will be, I suppose, a painful report to read. Um, so even if I was not able to to visit Palestine. I've investigated violations committed by the Israeli authorities, by the Palestinian authorities, uh, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. And, uh, and yes, there are many issues that need to be addressed. Yeah, and you know what? You just uh, uh, helped me remember something that I wanted to ask you. So you're you're not allowed to go visit certain places in the West Bank or the West Bank? Like what? Are you being prevented from going to these areas mm -hmm. to, to, to do your work? Mm. So country visits should be part of my are part of my mandate, and sure. Israel has no real. I mean, as part of the UN uh, family, Israel should comply with basic rules, including cooperation with my mandate. All the more because I'm not asking to go to Israel. <laughs> I'm asking to go to to Palestine. I have an invitation. Uh, extended to me by the Palestinian authorities. I had also agreed with the Palestinian authorities that I would be allowed to visit detention centers. So there was there was quite a, quite a significant program in place. I had agreed. I had a plan of visits uh, uh, in the entirety of uh, of the West Bank and East Jerusalem with Palestinian and Israeli organizations. I've done everything that I had planned. Online, in the sense, I had town hall meetings with uh, with uh, the refugees in various refugee camps uh, and with uh, um, with uh, people who have been detained, including children. And I'm very grateful to all the organizations who helped. I've spoken to medical professions, professionals both in Palestine and Israel and abroad, including in the US. Uh, so also to assess the trauma caused to the detainees, especially the young detainees, the, the, the level of violence that is uh, in, that is inflicted upon Palestinian children, Palestinian minors is unbelievable. And this is why I agree with the expression unchilding. I mean, depriving anyone of childhood is the, is the worst we can do. And this is what is done in a systematic way. So uh, I've done everything in three months and a half, and I've even toured places like Hebron and uh, Masafer Yatta, refugee camps uh, through, yeah, technology. Um, so I was not allowed to go because I was said, okay, I, I was given the reassurance by Israeli authorities uh, that uh, that uh, they would uh, they would facilitate they would not hamper my entry. But then the permit that I was encouraged to uh, apply to, to apply for has, has still not been received. Let's put it this way. But again, this is against the, the law because Israel doesn't have, again, as I, as I stress, Israel, right. as an occupying power, Israel cannot extend its migration border control policies to the occupied territory. Okay, yeah, I promised I would not ask more questions and yeah, there I go. So I'll leave it there. Um, I mean, you can, not, uh, it's not your fault. It's, you can, it's, it's wonderful. We love it. Um, you can find her on uh, Twitter at... Um, F R A N C E S C K A L B S. So Francesca um, K um, A L B S. Um, please um, watch out for her next report. I um, can't wait to have you on again, Francesca. Thank you for taking the time and um, have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.